War. In ancient Greece, it was a fundamental aspect of the interactions between the polar states. The cause of war ranged from religious or economic reasons to personal desires or strategic moves. It was constant and it was bloody. In a sense, the peace treaties and truces interrupted warfare rather than the other way around. For as unjustified as the call to war could be, the battle on the battlefield was just as terrible. The main unit of the classical Greek war machine was the hoplite. These infantrymen were clad in a bronze cuirass and greaves, and are well known for their iconic Corinthian helmets and shield. The heavy shield is called a hoplon or aspis. It was a large round shield with a strap in the inside, another near the edge allowing for movability of the shield. However, its uses mainly stemmed from its size and bowl shape. It covered most of the body, but most importantly allowed for the formation of phalanxes where several hoplites would link their shields, creating a wall where they could attack with their spears through the gaps between the shields. Other uses included, apparently, using it as a makeshift raft to float across rivers and to carry the dead in the bowl of the shield. On the battlefield, Fighting for the hoplite was fierce, and it was bloody. It's important to note that most hoplites were peasant levies, farmers who, outside the fighting season, would tend to their crops and cattle. There were exceptions, of course, like the hoplites of Sparta and the mercenary armies across Greece. However, this factored largely into how the battles would be played out. The nature of the hoplite meant that it was best set for open, level terrain. On this terrain, the commanders will set out their hoplites in neat formations to approach the enemy, typically a phalanx. In these formations, both sides would approach each other at a steady pace, until one would charge forward as commanded, with the cavalry swinging in from the sides to attack. However, whatever neatness the commanders sought was often lost upon impact. The fighting was intense. It wasn't helped by the limited vision due to the visor of the helmets, and the heavy weight of the armor they wore would have been cumbersome. And the fact they were largely farmers meant they lacked the sufficient training and fighting. The fighting was down and dirty, as the hoplites would slash away at the enemies as it was kill or be killed. Of course, the Greeks were not purely blind warmongers declaring war at the drop of the hat. They understood the terribleness of war. They saw the economic, personal, and manpower costs of going to war. Sometimes, battles will have rules to them pre-arranged by both parties, such as a time limit to stop the outright slaughter of one side, and the defeated side would negotiate terms and collect their dead and wounded. Greek warfare, being as it was, meant that having the best army made you the dominant power of Greece as the Spartan victory in 404 can attest to. Every power was trying to one-up each other in the quest for dominance, and the two main areas of warfare that made them the victor were superb discipline and superb weaponry. The Spartans, for example, had amazing discipline, deriving from their warrior culture and their GOG training program, and they also helped to maintain formation in battle through the use of a pipe player whistling a rhythm to which they marched and fell into formation. An example of the latter though, can be seen with the defeater of the Spartans, the Thebans. Among the amazing discipline of the sacred band, the Thebans had invented a longer spear that could better breach enemy phalanx formations, and a spearhead formation of their own that helped smash through enemy lines. But even the sacred band's training was only on par to that of the Spartan Agog. Philip from his stay in Thebes had learnt this important lesson about needing superb discipline and superb weaponry, and so went about creating a new military structure that incorporated both, and something the Greeks had never seen before, the Macedonian war machine. Although its infantry base was largely made of peasant levies, Macedonia excelled in its cavalry. This companion cavalry consisted of the Macedonian rich noble class who could afford their steed and armour. 
but the cavalry wouldn't be able to save Macedonia on its own, so Philip needed to transform the peasant levies into a well-trained fighting force. The issue with them was that they were peasants and that they were levies. They were untrained farmers who were only called to war when conscripted upon against invading tribes, who made small work of them. So Philip sought to end these issues and still attract them. He introduced standard pay and allowed for promotion pathways as well as arms and armour paid by the kingdom. These new infantrymen would become the bread and butter of the Macedonian war machine. They were the elite Hippaspus, or shield bearers. They were untrained in the fighting methods of the hoplites, and especially in 358, they couldn't have their level of training. However, these Hippaspus had a uniqueness that was beyond anything that of hoplite warfare, the Sarissa. This was a spear unlike any other that would reach a length of about 4.5 meters, far exceeding the 1.5 meter length of the hoplite spear. These hypaspis were organized into taxis, regiments, that formed a massed body called the phalanx. When charging into battle, the first five rows would lower their sarissas and thrust them back and forth. The sheer length made them untouchable, but the spearhead of the sarissa was unlike that of the hoplites, and was designed to pierce through armor and flesh. So in these deep lines of spears, it was invincible. These taxis were formed into battalions that composed of soldiers from the same areas of the Upper and Lower Macedonia, and the areas where he would conquer. This tactic would make battalions competitive and eager to fight ever the more to prove their people's worth, exactly what Philip wanted in making a devoted army. In Philip's army, excellence was awarded with promotions, and for the Hippaspus, the highest rank infantrymen were the Pesatari, or foot companions. They were his elite infantry division. They acted as his bodyguards, and on the battlefield were a unique lighter armoured force akin to Hypaspus that would move faster. Although Philip's reforms did largely focus on the infantry, he did not neglect his cavalry, as that was the strength of Macedonia. He divided his cavalry into divisions called Elay, about 200 men in size. These Elay were also divided based on where they were enlisted, to the same effectiveness as the Hippaspus. Philip also evolved the typical cavalry strategy of attacking with a frontal charge, and taught his cavalry to form wedge formations. This was borrowed from the famous cavalry of the Scythians. It was designed to breach enemy lines and was devastating in practice. Philip also created an allay called the Padromi or Sarasaphori. This unit was a light scouting cavalry that was both fast and powerful. They carried an extended Cyston, a cavalry lance of the regular cavalry, jokingly called a Sarissa due to its length, which may have been close to 4 meters in total. Its uses vary from scouting to a vanguard force and even as bodyguards in another unique division called the Etari, or Companions. To be among these ranks was an immense honour and highly competitive, with each cavalryman being personally handpicked by the king. Aside from the overhaul of the infantry and cavalry systems, Philip also made another fundamental change that would confuse and surprise his enemies. Each soldier was made to be somewhat self-sufficient, able to fight on their own and as a single body in a phalanx, as well as carrying their own arms, equipments and food. This helped to largely minimise the baggage train of his army in comparison to his enemies. The Greeks, for example, would have their families, wives, slaves, and even prostitutes accompany them on their marches. Philip, on the other hand, forbade the same for his marches. Whatever other baggage that was not carried by the troops were carried not by the oxen as typical of land armies of the time, but rather by much faster moving mules and horses, leaving the oxen to remain in the Macedonian farms and contribute to the economy. Thus. With these changes, Philip was able to confuse his enemies 
by marching with lightning speed across Greece. And so, with these reforms, the conscript army Philip inherited was gone. In its place was a well-trained army unlike any before it. It moved with lightning speed and would smash through any opposition it faced. However, the true extent of the Macedonian war machine would come into effect only by the time of Alexander's Persian conquest as Philip initiated these reforms over the next couple decades. In 358, Philip had at least remade the infantry and cavalry compositions and structure. With this new and improved army, he would go about unifying his kingdom. It had only been a year since the king was enthroned, and now he was turning the tables. In the spring of 358, Philip set his sights on securing his borders, and the first on his list were the Paeonians. Philip knew that a conscientious push from the Paeonians would be a difficult invading force to stop. Luckily, the Paeonian king who so wanted to invade Macedonia, Agus, died and left the chieftain nobles of Paeonia confused and disorganized. A perfect time to strike. The exact details are sketchy, but in a short amount of time, Philip conquered Paeonia and its fate was determined by a pitched battle that Philip won. Now, without missing a beat, Philip reared his army around to the west to invade Illyria. Bardellus was shocked. He was completely caught off guard and had no chance to mount and form a counter-offensive. So, Bardellus sent terms to Philip for peace. Dardania will keep all its territory in Upper Macedonia, but the Dardanians will never invade Macedonia ever again. Philip received the terms, but any hope for Philip to stop his invasion were quickly out the window. Philip wanted the Illyrians out of Macedonia, for good. Unable to appease Philip, Bardilus was left with only one option, to beat Philip in a pitched battle near Heraclea Lacentis, close to Lake Ored. The forces of each side were about even in numbers. Philip had 10,000 infantry and 300 cavalry, whilst Bardilus had 10,000 infantry and 200 cavalry. The numbers were similar, but the quality was different. Bardilus would have realized that the Macedonian cavalry far exceeded his own, so the day was to be won by his veteran Dardanian infantry that terrorized Epirus and Macedonia for decades prior. Bardilus at this point would have been about 90, However, he was still sharp, and so was his tactical abilities. Bardellus organized his troops in a square formation, a hollow re rectangle with infantry on all sides, so that if Philip were to try and outflank him with his cavalry, he would be met with Dardanian infantry. Bardellus, expecting a typical frontal assault, made the front-facing side of the rectangle consist of his most veteran and hardest troops. Philip saw this formation, and drew inspiration from Epaminondas at Lucra. He arranged his infantry line at an angle, so that his right protruded further than his left, and placed himself and his cavalry on the right. Once his line was settled, he started to march his Hippaspus phalanxes forward in this line. This angled formation allowed Philip to sweep from right into Badellus' left flank, while the rest of the army lightly engaged the strong central line of the Dardanians. This battle too was going to either be won or lost by the Macedonian infantry. The long Sarissas helped to keep the enemy at a distance, but the veteran fighters were still an able foe. However, Philip's combined cavalry and infantry assault on Bardilus' left flank created breaches, and soon the flank collapsed. Philip's Epaspus poured through the open side of the rectangle and into the hollow interior, along with the deadly Hattori companion cavalry, and attacked the Dardanians from behind while the rest of Philip's angle line scooped in around the Dardanian right flank. Bardilus' forces were crushed from the combined weight of the Hippaspus and Hattori. All remaining forces, including the king, went into a rout from the Macedonian army. The battle was won and Philip had regained the Macedonian supremacy 
of Upper Macedonia, and Philip also made it clear that he was not taking any invasion threats to his kingdom lightly. Philip had more than doubled the size of his kingdom, and through reforms and other policies such as incorporating the Upper Macedonians, Illyrian tribes and Paeonians into his army, he had helped build a solid level of unity to his kingdom, and thus the kingdom became centralised at Pella as its capital. The integration of these people was met with little opposition, and their loyalty became easy. In fact, Philip even gained his most loyal commander, Parmenion, a Paeonian, who would serve him well into Alexander's campaign. However, Philip wanted to ensure the loyalties to the Macedonian nobles, and at some time around now, he had made a new body called the School of Royal Pages. This was an induction school of the sons of the Macedonian nobles from the age of 14. They would live at court, receive military training, accompany the king on a campaign the year before they turned 18, and served as personal attendants. Although this helped to make a generation of brilliant generals and strategists, the body itself was a glorified hostage-taking tactic. The boys were not taken with the parents' consent, and the well-being of them depended wholly on the acts of the father. Thus, the nobles were in his grasp at his court at Pella. This centralization meant that Philip was now in a position to largely exploit the resources of Macedonia, creating an evolution of the largely barter economy into a proper coin-based economy. He could also now exploit the timber resources in Macedonia to mass-produce the Sarissa with the uncommon and dense corner wood, which did not bend as much, keeping the Sarissa largely straight even with their length. The new lands in Paeonia and Upper Macedonia were ripe with silver mines that generated large amounts of wealth. In addition, Paeonia gave Philip an opening into the powerful Dardanian trading sphere. As for Bardellus' granddaughter that Philip was forced to marry in the previous year, well, she changed her name from Odata to Eurydice to mask her Illyrian background as, understandably, the Illyrians were hugely unpopular at court. Continuing his offensive, Philip sought diplomatic relations with the aristocratic Alude family of Larissa and Thessaly. They shared a common ancestry and would serve as a perfect protector and buffer on Macedonia's southern border. Larissa, as we have mentioned before, was a bitter enemy of Foray, particularly ever since their leader in the 370s, the tyrant Jason of Foray, had attempted to subjugate all of Thessaly and expand into Macedonia and Epirus. He was stopped by the Thebans and Alexander II. However, his grandson, Alexander Foray, seems to have had similar ambitions. So, in the autumn of 358, Philip entered Thessaly with an army to deal with the ambitious Alexander. Although, he didn't do this with pure intentions. The Thessalian League was prone to factionalism between its members, so by Philip helping to neuter a major competitor to Lurus's dominance, he was securing their power. This power brought many benefits to Philip. Firstly, it helped to secure his southern border, and also provided him with superior Thessalian cavalry. Philip at this time wisely got his first ally with the Thessalian League, a powerful force in and of itself, but most important, its factionalism meant that if they ever struggled again with Foray, they would call on Philip to their aid, giving him an entrance into central Greek politics. Philip secured this alliance with another diplomatic marriage, this time to a Larissan woman of the leading Alude family, Felina. Although, this wouldn't be his only marriage around this time. In 357, less than a year later, Philip turned to a southwestern border with the Molossians of Epirus. Philip found hospitality with the Molossians, as Vidalus had also terrorized their domain, so they extended an alliance to Philip as a sign of their appreciation and an understandable mutual desire for border security. Thus, the Molossian king, King Aribus, married his niece and daughter of the late king Neoptolemus, Olympias, to Philip, 
This was to be his fourth wife, and in due time, his most important wife, as Philip was madly in love with her. Lastly, there were the Thracians to his east. The Idrisian kingdom had always been a threat to Macedonia. However, the Idrisian kingdom was no more, as we've discussed before. It was now split between three kings, Verisades, Amodocus, and Cusiblates. Each were more interested in vying for each other's powers rather than to invade Macedonia. Also, Verisades, the ruler of Western Thrace, was on good terms with Philip, for now. And so, Philip did a complete 180. Macedonia at the end of 359, a kingdom just barely saved from ambitious invaders and pretenders, to an upcoming power of the Balkans. He defeated the terrifying Dardanians, conquered the pestering Paeonians, and united Macedonia as never before seen, centralized the kingdom of Tepela, and created the start of a world-class army. Philip hadn't, however, yet overcome the hardest foes on Macedonia's borders, the Chalcidians and the Athenians. They were next on Philip's list.